This is Burlington, and here we are in the Channel 17 newsroom. And uh, I'm Margaret Harrington, your host for this ongoing nuclear free future conversation. And on my right is uh, Maggie Gunderson, the founder of Fairwinds Ed Energy Education. And over here is Arnie Gunderson, chief engineer of Fairwinds Ener Energy Education. Welcome back. Thank you for coming back again. You've, you've, you've done several wonderful, informative programs with us. And viewers, uh, we are very, very happy to welcome you back. Now, uh, Maggie Gunderson uh, founded Fairwinds en Energy Education and, uh, in 2008. And uh, she has a history of, uh, as an expert witness in the, uh, the firm. And she has a history as a uh, in the nuclear power industry and uh, everything like that. And I just wanted to fill in viewers who haven't uh, seen us before about what, what you have been doing. And uh, your last position with the nuclear power industry was as an executive recruiter. Yes. And, uh, and yes. Arnie, you, you have a, a long history in the nuclear, nuclear power industry, right? And, oh yeah. Uh, <clears throat> now forty uh, years. Forty years, and you you hold a nuclear safety patent. Also, you invented something for nuclear safety. I got out of college forty years ago this month. Uh huh. I was with a master's degree, so yes, that's a long time. Yes, and uh, recently you were called upon to go to Japan as an expert uh, on the Fukushima Daiichi disaster. Well, Maggie and I wrote a book, um, and uh, um, it's called Fukushima Daiichi, The Truth and the Future, and it's about what happened, the truth, which the Japanese government was not telling the people, and also the future, which is a, uh, a roadmap forward for the Japanese that doesn't involve building new nuclear power plants. And we, the title of our program today is Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, Fukushima Daiichi. What is the link? Correct. So let's start with uh, the fact that there is an opera that uh, is called Three Mile Island. Yes. And could you tell us about that, please? Yes, we just came back from Italy for the premiere of the opera. And it was created um, by a journalist who, um, uh, Carl Hoffman is his name, and he's an Italian and German journalist. Mm -hmm. And he knew Dr. Vergeiner, who was the foremost meteorologist in the world on the way radiation moves and on unique weather patterns, especially um, in unique weather areas, certain parts of Europe, certain parts of the U.S. He lived here for 15 years and studied U.S. weather patterns. And he was one of the experts on the case about Three Mile Island. The judge on that case threw out all the experts that were not U.S. experts, that were not U.S. citizens, and just said their testimony didn't matter, which is an appalling miscarriage of, of justice, I think. Yeah. What was the case? The case was from the plaintiffs who were downwinders or upwinders, the way the wind was blowing. Um, from the Three Mile Island accident and had um, had radiation burns or, or illnesses, had losses of animals on their farms, or had cancer. And they brought a case forward and sued the utility and wanted, um, you know, to have a, the case public and have it brought forward. And by the time the judge was finished, there were not a left, enough experts left to bring the case forward. And Arnie, you were an expert witness on that, right? Yeah, Dr. Vergeiner and I, and uh, uh, another guy, Dr. Steve Wing, um, um, actually there was a, um, uh, a flow. I, I calculated how much radiation came out of the nuclear reactor. And then Dr. Vergeiner um, took it through the wind and, and uh, showed where uh, within Pennsylvania the, the radiation wound up. And then um, this Dr. Steve Wing was able to look at the epidemiology and determine that, my God, where the wind was blowing, there in fact is statistically meaningful increases in cancer. Um, but, um, the, and I survived the, the, the process where expert witnesses are, are vetted. But um, um, Dr. Vergeiner was from Europe and, and uh, Judge Rambo just 
systematically threw out all the European experts. And uh, so the case stopped. But it didn't mean that the truth has to stop. And what, um, what we've been able to do is, um, is piece together a, a large amount of radiation, much more than the Nuclear Regulatory Commission says was released from Three Mile Island. Um, it blew up and down the river valley. Um, and you know, Vermont Yankee is a river valley site, so you get a, a situation where the hills confine the radiation movement, so it doesn't move out uniformly, it moves up and down the river valley. And then Dr. Wing was able to show uh, in the river valley 20% um, uh, increases in cancer. So um, uh, the, the truth can't be stopped even though the case was. And, and I think what Arnie's trying to say is, you know, Three Mile Island was a, was a river valley site. Like some of our viewers here in Vermont will know, Vermont Yankee is a river valley site. And so those patterns exist, and they, they exist throughout the U.S. at different sites. And um, it, it's pertinent to show how radiation moves. And as we've seen with Fukushima Daiichi, radiation knows no boundaries. Yeah, the phrase you used, it goes where the wind is blowing. Exactly. And uh, now... So how it became an opera, I think that was your yes, original question. Yes, but, but I, I, I know, uh, I, we want to get to that, but I want to know what the NRC concluded at, for about Three Mile Island. Because uh, uh, this is, uh, like, it's old, it's old news now, 1979, this is when this disaster happened. And uh, people have forgotten about it. Well, if you go up on the NRC website, um, they say that uh, no one died and very little radiation was released, even today. So uh, um, basically they totally ignore the, uh, uh, the information that's available. The, um, the key is that um, um, I was able to determine that a lot more radiation was released than was ever planned before that and it was ever analyzed by the NRC before that. Then that radiation moved and um, uh, followed, um, followed the river valley uh, and we're sure that uh, people in that river valley got much higher radiation exposures than uh, uh, they were ever, uh, th th than federal authorities ever indicated. And so the NRC, as, as the expert on where the radiation goes, is still using whatever process they used to determine how much radiation is uh, expelled. We have, a, we have a good video on our site. Uh, it's a me for half an hour talking about nuclear power at, at Three Mile Island. And it specifically goes to that. The NRC deliberately distorted the calculations to make the exposures low. This, this is an old story, and it's a new story. It's a continuing story about deliberately changing the information. This is shocking. And right now, we're sitting in, in, at uh, a, a little over a year after the Fukushima Daiichi disaster. Right. And, uh, and the NRC has given 20-year extensions to Vermont Yankee and, and to other, power, other aged power plants. This is, this is terrible uh, news that's old news, and it's, it's new news at the same time. And now, can we get to the opera now? It, this opera was in Europe. Three it's called Three Mile Island, and I have a Andrea Molino. Was he the... Uh... He was the composer, and Carl Hoffman, who's a noted journalist on radio, has a 30-year career in radio in Germany and Italy, and has been the foreign correspondent from Germany to Italy and lives in Italy. Mm. He's the one who made this... He also makes film. He's a filmmaker. And he's the one who filmed Arnie and filmed Dr. Vergeiner originally. He met Dr. Vergeiner on a train, and the two of them had this discussion 30 years ago um, about Three Mile Island and Dr. Vergeiner's findings, built up this friendship, and then um, Carl Hoffman started filming Dr. Vergeiner because he just thought the story was so compelling and he had at some point wanted to bring it forward and, and he continued to research nuclear issues around the world, especially, you know, after both Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, he wanted, you know, this information to be brought public and be in his, a historical record. 
And uh, after the accident of Fukushima Daiichi, he wanted to show how these issues are tied together and that radiation, where, how it moves, what the patterns are, what happens, and, and why um, we need concern worldwide about all the existing nuclear power plants. So he commissioned um, this uh, opera to be done. Um, it's multimedia, so Arnie was on film, Dr. Vergeiner was on film, different um, people in the Pennsylvania area, the area of Three Mile Island, who have cancers from the nuclear plant were on film and they were talking about what they went through and, and um, what their health issues are and how little support they've had ongoing. And um, there was mus wonderful music and just a whole storyline uh, from a, dramatic, a dramatist about our responsibilities to the Earth as, as citizens of, of this planet. So it was a really interesting take that they came up with and they created, they got the funding, they did the opera in two locations, two premieres. One was in Germany in Munich in March and we had been invited to that one and couldn't because of some testimony Arnie had going on. And then we had been invited last October, you know, this early, f when Arnie was filmed for the um, premiere in, in Rome. And so we had committed that we could make that and we went over and it was just an amazing production, amazing contacts around that. Arnie and Dr. Sharia Badi, um, who was a Nobel Peace Prize winner from Iran uh, on a peace movement on protecting women and children and on not using depleted uranium in the world because of uh, health effects and again that DU is used on warheads and then it ends up spreading everywhere this uranium and, and it's very carcinogenic and what does that do to the children and families living there, pregnant women and any soldiers in proximity who then get that in their DNA. And then Arnie spoke about the accident from Fukushima Daiichi through Mile Island, Chernobyl, and what came out from that. And he spoke about operating nuclear plants and the constant radiation that they give off. So all, it was just, they did a, a press conference at the Italian Press Club and they did a symposium before the opera itself. Mm. And was the, all this part of a, uh, a an, another event? It was sponsored by the Italian Philharmonic that okay. had brought them over and um, by an Itali um, the International Peace, I can't say the Italian name for the organization, I apologize, I'm not fluent in Italian, and um, that um, organization set up the symposium and uh, the press conference. Could you refresh my memory and the viewer's memory, Arnie, about the depleted uranium, how that originates? Where does it come from? Yeah, that, um, that's a weapons issue and not a nuclear power issue, but um, the uranium in the ground is 99% uranium-238 and a little less than 1% uranium-235. So you need the 235 to run a power plant, so there's a process where that's enriched to five or five or six percent and the uranium that's uh, 238 then 99 percent become 99.8 percent or something like that that's called depleted uranium it goes from 99 percent to 90 almost 100 percent uranium 238 so you're actually saying that you need the nuclear power plants in order to to get this depleted uranium yes you use the the, the leftovers from the nuclear power plant um, to produce the depleted uranium. Now that's uh, basically a waste, uh, except that now the, the military uses it in, uh, in weapons. Um, it's used in um, uh, high velocity rounds from like the M1 tank. Um, and what, what makes it a great weapon is that it um, is pyrophoric. And that what that means is that when the particle hits, it doesn't need an explosive warhead. The friction is enough uh, on the, between the metal and the uranium is enough to cause the uranium to spontaneously explode. So it doesn't need TNT or, or, or 
um, you know, some sort of a explosive warhead. Um, but the, the problem is that it atomizes the uranium, and of course uranium is radioactive, and these incredibly small pieces of, um, of radioactive uranium wind up being volatilized as a gas and inhaled by the soldiers and by the people in the war zone. So um, our soldiers, Iranian soldiers, um, Af Afghan soldiers are breathing in the uranium dust from the explosion caused by the depleted uranium uh, pellet. If there were no nuclear power plants, the governments would continue getting the new, continue getting depleted uranium. Isn't that so? Um, I think the depleted uranium is, uh, the, from the government standpoint, is a is a great way to get rid of something that would be a waste. Um, you know, they've got an, an opportunity now to put it into a warhead as opposed to you know put it back into the ground or or, or dispose of it another way. Um, of course, the problem is now when a when a tank or something is uh, um, explodes from a depleted uranium warhead, that tank then has to get taken back to the United States and disposed of as nuclear waste because it's contaminated with this volatilized um, uh, uranium. My personal opinion is that it, it's uh, a violation of the Geneva Convention, that it's really wrong to use these weapons, that people who inhale the uh, volatilized uranium are, are being killed 20 years later or 25 years later and it, it's just terrible and that it's pyrophoric as Arnie said there's n you can't put it out the fire can't be put out and if you spray water on it it gets hotter and it continues burning more so it's, it's just a terrible misuse and I think is a horrible um, liaison that shows the horrible connection between the military industrial complex and the nuclear industry and, and to keep this chain going. And that, that's my personal opinion. You know, the, the, the Geneva Convention says it's okay to shoot somebody and kill them. That, that's, that's war. But what happens with a depleted uranium warhead is that the person may die 20 years later from the radiation exposure they received. And that's outside of the bounds of the Geneva Convention. Well, when, when, we, uh, when we decided upon the topic for our program today, we said, what is the link? So let's, let's uh, cut to the chase on that. What is the link between Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima Daiichi? We're talking about a time frame of uh, 30 years. Um, when I knew Fukushima Daiichi was melting down, I, I told Maggie, I, I cannot, personally, I cannot let this get covered up like Three Mile Island did. And I could see it already happening on the very first day. You know, the, the government of Japan was denying the severity of the accident. Well, the same thing happened at, at Chernobyl and the same thing happened at, at Three Mile Island. So the government's first reaction is to, is to deny the severity of the accident. Um, that worked at Three Mile Island, and it worked at Chernobyl because we didn't have the internet. And now, of course, we have the internet, and, and you know, Ma Maggie's gotten this website going, the, the Fairwind site, and we've been able to get um, information out to the Japanese as well as to Americans, but I think in, in my heart, most importantly, it's gotten out to the Japanese that, um, that talks about just how severe this accident was. We were telling the Japanese seven weeks before their own government admitted it was as bad as Chernobyl, we were telling that to the Japanese. So, so number one is uh, the government will try to cover up um, unless there's an alternative media available. And the cover-up includes the action or the, act, the actions taken and not taken. For example, the evacuation of the people from where the Fukushima Daiichi disaster happened. Could you talk about that, please? Yeah, the, um, you know, I, I was on CNN saying, uh, you've got to evacuate the women and the children out to 50 miles. And, and uh, the Japanese were saying, well, you've got to evacuate them out to about six miles. So um, they, they deliberately kept people in their homes instead of telling them to, to head to areas that were uncontaminated. 
Then in addition, in Japan, their calculations showed a highly radioactive plume moving to the northwest. And the government knowingly evacuated people into that plume. So they moved them from, uh, from areas near the plant that were uh, outside of the plume, and they moved them around into the plume where they were more irradiated than they would have been. It's just, it was um, uh, truly uh, amazing that the Japanese government wouldn't, um, uh, uh, would treat their uh, life with such a callous uh, attitude. Exactly. When you say that the government knowingly evacuated them into the plume, was that based on their idea that radiation is not harmful? There's, um, I'm not sure whether they were just totally confused, and I, but I don't think so. Uh, I think they didn't want to cause a panic, and um, uh, that seems to be um, the motive. It, you know, if, there, if there's a motive between Three Mile Island and Chernobyl and um, Fukushima Daiichi, it's that um, everybody believes the best numbers. Oh, it's really not too bad, and I don't want to cause a panic as opposed to believing the worst numbers. I'm like, oh my God, my responsibility is to the people and I, I, I should inform people to, uh, to get away as quickly as possible. So That's government tends to, um, to, to look at it backward. They want to protect themselves as opposed to protect the people. And I think an important point in that is, is that the bureaucracy, that none of the industry didn't believe and the government didn't believe a major accident could ever really happen. And so the bureaucracy wasn't well set up to do this. That department who had charge of that material sent it to somebody else who didn't realize the import. And they weren't allowed to release it themselves. And so as things filtered in, it filtered in to one or two top people. Those people were overwhelmed, plus they were trying to protect TEPCO, plus they were looking at what was going on on site and not looking at the larger picture. Now you say Tep TEPCO is, is the Tokyo, Tokyo Electric Power. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. And and there's even memos that have come forward this year from Prime Minister's office and Medi. Uh, Medi is the Ministry of Minis It's <coughs> a specific ministry that oversees um, industry in Japan, especially the nuclear industry. And there's memos where they said the first priority that the Medi director wrote was the first priority is to protect uh, Tokyo Electric, TEPCO, and its investment, and not to let anyone know how bad things were. I mean, that's hellacious. Is, is this uh, METI comparable to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission here? Is that the same kind of caliber of uh, organization? Yeah, it's similar. There's, there's, there are differences, but it's essentially um, the organization chartered to regulate. And, and when you're in, And when you're responsible for industry in general and you believe nuclear power is cheap and industry needs more of it, when you have a nuclear accident and plants melting down, it's hard to then admit that you screwed up, that, that uh, you should have um, behaved differently. And so bureaucracies, well, I guess one of the things I learned in looking at all three of those accidents is that bureaucracies will protect themselves first. Then if there's any extra wiggle room, then they'll protect the people. But you will not get a, a government to protect the people if it jeopardizes the government. And, and that's what happened in all three cases. And. It, it can happen again. It can happen wherever there are nuclear power plants. Yes, we've, um, uh, you know, the course of the United States is saying, well, it can't happen here. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has basically uh, um, uh, said that for, for the last year. You know, we've looked at our plants, our plants are different. We're not gonna get a 65 foot high tsunami, so therefore don't worry about it. But the real root causes of that of the accident, the NRC is glossing over or allowing utilities to answer in five or six years. And I think other countries are as bad or worse. And, you know, it's, uh, we've got an entirely different design in Canada, an entirely different design in Eastern Europe. Um, and um, uh, sooner or later, uh, as a matter of fact, there's a study out of Europe right now that says there will be another Chernobyl in 10 or 20 years. And there'll be another Fukushima in 10 or 20 years. So that 
um, that this is not a once in a million year phenomena. We can expect about every 10 or 20 years having um, a nation's social fabric so destroyed that it may lead to the destruction of the nation. And, and it affects the DNA of the human race, according to Dr. Helen Caldicott, because there is so much continuous radiation now coming out, especially in the northern hemisphere throughout the globe. And, um, you know, what does that mean for us as a species? This is terrible. I, in just, just in an anecdotal uh, remark, I met a woman from Hawaii who was teaching at the University of Hawaii, and she said that her most needy students are the children from the Marshall Islands, and from Jeju Islands and the Marshall Islands, and they go, they're not American citizens, but they go to the University of Hawaii for free because the United States is well aware of of the horrible things that have been done to the people of the uh, Marshall Islands for because of the atomic testing, oh my nuclear testing. And uh, she said that their learning disabilities and their general, uh, their, their general well-being is so pathetic in the light of, of all of the nuclear testing there. So this is just somebody that I met in, in uh, socially, and another person that I met who had gone to, who was a Ukrainian, of Ukrainian lineage, and uh, she went back to uh, Chernobyl with her church group, and she said that she, could, she couldn't speak of, of the horrors that she saw there with the, with the children and with the, the uh, whole um, echo system there. Yep. It is uh, so pathetic, and, and these are, are these are not scholars, and they're they're not scientists, but they're people who are experiencing this uh, with their own eyes and and uh, and telling the story. The, so. the, there are documented cases of scientists being thrown in jail for five years for trying to study the accident at Chernobyl. Um, you know, and and of course now at Fukushima, we're not throwing scientists in jail. But it, uh, I'm being approached all the time by scientists who are having great difficulty getting their reports published uh, because of industrial pressure. Uh, people just don't want to admit the severity of this, the accident releases, and uh, are um, in control of the scientific journals, which makes it difficult to publish. We, ha we know one lead scientist who done a, did an amazing study and submitted it to five journals, and finally, one of the, the five journals took it and, and brought it forward and it was given at a symposium and everything. But four journals all received incredible pressure to not publish that work. And all of them have board members from the nuclear industry on those. Rachel Carson had a saying, uh, uh, the author of Silent Spring, and, and she said that um, when uh, professional organizations are also supported by large industries where those professionals work. When the professional organization speaks, who are we hearing? The scientists or the industries who are profiting? Right. And, and I think that's uh, as true with Silent Spring in the chemical industry as it is with the nuclear industry. Um, the, um, the, uh, the, the profit motive has infiltrated the uh, scientific community to the point where scientists working outside of the mainstream are, um, they're not thrown in jail in the United States. We just um, prevent them from getting funding for their research. They're marginalized and uh, no attention is paid. And it's, it's a terrible situation. Now I noticed that uh, the Nuclear Energy Institute has stepped up a whole lot of advertising again. And have you noticed that in, in various magazines and everything, the full page ads, the full page cover, back cover ads from the Nuclear Energy Institute? And it seems to come at the same time as the uh, two nuclear power plants were reopened in Japan, mm -hmm. yes. very quietly. Did we know? Did we all notice that that uh, there was hardly any kind of press, they doubled, media press? They doubled their advertising budget after uh, this year. And so the, the, in 2012, uh, in response to the accident last year, the, um, the their budget went from uh, their advertising budget doubled. Um, they're now on uh, the John Stewart Show. Uh, has accepted NEI as a uh, as a sponsor. We think that's horrible, and and we've stopped watching John Stewart as long as that's going on. And he was like our favorite 
commentator you know yeah. and, and the ads are factually wrong they're clever but they're factually wrong and yet they uh, they are making it into mainstream media um, any I uh, the charter of any if you go up on the web their charter is uh, not a neutral charter but it's to promote nuclear power um, and um, and they're very effective when you have you know tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars to spend on advertising uh, they're very effective they're on NPR they're sponsoring um, the um, the commercial show the the, the the show about commerce I'm sorry I can't remember the name right now Mar um, market watch no yeah, yeah. Um, Something like that. Something like. Oh, no yeah. wonder then. Yeah. When uh, I, I had asked NPR to have uh, Dr. Helen Caldicott, who wrote "Nuclear Power Is Not the Answer," mm -hmm. to be interviewed on NPR when she was here a few years ago, there was no response for Dr. Helen, Helen Caldicott, who wrote this book, "Nuclear Power Is Not the Answer." They, uh, they are uh, Nuclear Energy Institute. Their blog has spent an inordinate amount of time attacking us. Uh, with factually wrong things, and they raised some really critical questions in um, was it April? A yeah, about yeah, about, <clears throat> about us and about the uh, fair winds, and so uh, they said they wanted Arnie to respond, and he doesn't respond to any of that. He doesn't own the company I do, and I responded to them, and they said they were going to print the response, but they didn't. Um, uh, several uh, stations. Uh, David Graham, who's an AP reporter here in Vermont, had done an incredible piece of coverage and they went after him and AP stood behind him and stood behind his story and they said they would print whatever any I said they would they attacked David viciously and they said in their blog they would print whatever AP's response was but they never did. That you know it's just an, a vicious attack dog. So we actually wrote back to NEI and 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 they, I did, yeah. yeah, Maggie did, and uh, and they never printed our response despite the fact that they said they were going to. So it's just, um, um, yeah, they're when you know they they can't argue the facts, so instead they they result on character assassination. Um, Attempted, yeah. And and it hasn't just been Fukushima that happened to Fukushima be about Daiichi. Fukushima Daiichi, but it's also about work I'm doing out in California. Um, it, it, it's interesting. They attacked an expert report I wrote, and the headline was another shoddy report. Um, and well, in fact, San Onofre. San yes. Onofre. This is a San Onofre out in yeah. California. And in fact, everything I said in that report was proven to be true by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Now, will they retract their their uh, their personal attack on me? No, because uh, it it is uh, about uh, destroying people's character. And it's not just um, uh, civilians. They've attacked the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and, and basically got him to, uh, forced him to resign. Yes, um, step nothing down. can stop the... As we uh, discussed the last time yes, we were on yes. the show. The, the, his name is ja Jaxo? Jasko. Jasko. Chairman yes. Jasko was forced. Nuclear Energy Institute lobbied very hard, along with several of the commissioners that they have endorsed to get him, to force him out because he was trying to regulate the industry as it should be regulated. Yeah. Well, the evacuation plan and the potassium oxide issue. Potassium uh, could, iodide. Uh, potassium iodide, yes. Can you tell me uh, something about that? Because I know that uh, people who are near nuclear power plants are supposed to be given this. Yeah, it's, um, <clears throat> it doesn't protect you from all the radiation, but it does protect you from the radioactive iodine if you take the pill. Uh, in Japan, they had the pills available in the town halls, but the procedures required that they be released by the national government. And the national government didn't release them for eight days. So the pills sat while people were being exposed to the radioactive iodine before they were released. And it's another example of shame on the government. Um, so there's a lot of children showing up now with enlarged thyroids and thyroid damage and now that the government has decided well most of them are okay so we're going to check once a year and, and it's just terrible terrible they're just not looking at these kids they're not doing what needs to be done to protect them at all and the NRC in America for the longest time said potassium iodide wasn't uh, necessary to have pre-mobilized because it would give people a bad impression of nuclear power and this is our regulator was, was had taken the position that um, um, the, the uh, 
imp the bad impression was more important than the health effects from a potential accident. Tell me about what you know, something about the evacuation plans for some of the nuclear power plants here in the Northeast. Uh, yeah, well, let's look at uh, Pilgrim. There's probably the, there's actually two in the Northeast that are bad. Uh, Indian Point, which is only 25 miles away from downtown New York City. And it's in a river valley, and which way will the radiation move, but right down the river valley. Um, and the, but the other one is, is Pilgrim out on Cape Cod. Um, Pilgrim sits at the end of the hook of Cape Cod, and if it were to have an accident, the people on the Cape would have to what's called shelter in place. In other words, your first reaction is to run, but if you're on Cape Cod, you have to run toward the accident to get across the bridges so that the, um, uh, the, the net effect is that the government will, will prevent them from leaving and force them to stay in their homes while the radioactive plume uh, moves over them. And what are the consequences of that? Well, if we look at, you know, uh, at, at Fukushima, we've got uh, serious contamination out to 50 miles. Um, and, of course, the Cape is even closer than that. So it, it's, it's entirely likely that people would be um, um, covered by uh, not just radioactive gases, but radioactive particulate as well, and be forced to stay in their homes by the government that's supposed to be protecting them. And if we look at Three Mile Island and look at Dr. Steve Wing that Arnie talked about earlier, he is a noted epidemiologist of univers at University of North Carolina. And his studies show, I mean, they're con totally conclusive with public data that shows the cancer rates that increase because of Three Mile Island. And that was right in the path. And you get it on the West Coast, too. The other bad one is, is San Onofre, which has uh, 8 million people within 50 miles. And what's happened is it was a little burg when, when it was built 40 years ago. But his you know, population explosion has, has blossomed around that plant so that um, uh, in the event of a serious accident, it would be impossible to evacuate. And in the event of a serious accident, all of our food is grown there. You know, 8 million people are there. Enormous industries are there it would be trillions of dollars of loss uh, in the event of a serious accident at San Onofre. I hope that there will be a day when there will be no nuclear power plants anywhere. And viewers, we know that, that things can change quickly. In, in the country of Germany, they have decided to phase out nuclear power. That happened very quickly. And it happened because of a pol uh, politically savvy uh, head of state, Angela Merkel, listened to her vote, to the people who would either keep her in office or not. And she listened to, to their concerns. So viewers, let's, let's hope that our legislators can listen too, right. to the, the truth. But it's so sad that the truth is, is uh, as rare as, as a perfect diamond in this culture. And here we have some information that is very valuable to us. So I'd, I'd like you to please uh, say uh, something in, as an ending to this program now. It, again, it's disturbing but enlightening. And I thank you very much for coming. And please come back again. So. We'd love to come back again. And I thank you for hosting both of us. And, and our work is very challenging and very disturbing because we see so many people who are being in, impacted, both from a long time ago at Three Mile Island in Chernobyl, and currently from Fukushima Daiichi's triple meltdown on the radiation releases there, and, and the risks that the industry is taken, taking with people's lives. We see that every day. So it's, it's sobering work. Um, I did nuclear public relations, and, and Arnie was lead engineer. That's how we met on a particular project. And um, I no longer support this industry at all. I, I, I can't believe that the industry didn't work together after this triple meltdown to help protect the people of the world. Arnie? Well, there are, there are better ways in the 21st century to generate power than, than to, burn, uh, to, to burn uranium. Uh, a good friend of mine is, is David Friedman, who was the chairman of Tennessee Valley Authority. And he said, it makes absolutely no sense to replace carbon dioxide 
with plutonium. He said, there's got to be a better way than either of those two. So we have a false choice. People are saying, well, global warming, we need to have uranium. Uranium means plutonium, means, means uh, keeping this stuff in the environment for a quarter of a million years. Th there are better ways, and we just need the political will to, uh, to, to make that change. And if we're speaking about political will, a lot of Republicans throughout the country are talking about the cost, the fiscal cost. Well, our own um, former NRC commissioner, Peter Bradford, has repeatedly said feeding um, people ca fee to cure world hunger it, with caviar would be like trying to cure the energy crisis with nuclear power. I mean, it's just not cost effective. So to any Republicans listening to this program, look at it. Just If you want to be just in the fiscal standpoint, look at that and know it just doesn't work. On that note, let's, let's, could you repeat what Mr. Bradford said? And we'll, we'll end on that note. Thank you, viewers, for watching. And uh, we'll end up on Peter Bradford's yeah, His quote. exact quote is, uh, trying to solve um, uh, global warming by building nuclear power plants is identical to try, trying to solve uh, global hunger by feeding everyone caviar. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank Goodbye you. for now. The building show. And the control building right next to the reactor building shook as well. Operators in the building noticed their gauges going crazy, and literally the floor shook as if there was an earthquake. They looked at the pressure gauge in the containment, and they realized there had been an explosion. Over the years, the more I learned, and the more I heard, the less I trusted both people in authority with our government and also the people who ran the plant. And that's sad. It's, 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 it's like a loss of innocence.